Welcome, curious minds, to another journey through the corridors of time with Facts Intrigue. Today, we delve into the shadows of history to uncover the lives of those whose actions have etched their names into the annals of infamy. Prepare yourself for a chilling exploration into Beyond Wicked, history's most diabolical figures. But before we embark on this dark journey, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and click the bell icon so you never miss an episode. Now, let us step into the darkness. In the tapestry of human history, there are threads woven with blood, terror, and unrelenting cruelty. These are the stories of men and women whose deeds have cast long shadows over the ages, leaving an indelible mark on the world. Our first figure is one who has become synonymous with the very essence of evil, Vlad the Impaler. Vlad III, Prince of Wallachia, ruled in the mid-15th century. His reign was marked by a ruthless defense of his homeland against the encroaching Ottoman Empire. But it is not his military prowess that history remembers. It is his unparalleled brutality. Vlad's preferred method of punishment was impalement, a gruesome process where victims were skewered alive on stakes, left to die slowly and agonizingly. It is said that he impaled over 20,000 people, creating forests of the dead to instill fear in his enemies. This horrific legacy earned him the moniker Vlad the Impaler and inspired the legend of Count Dracula. Vlad III, also known as Vlad Dracula, was born in 1431 in Sigishwara, Transylvania. His father, Vlad II, Dracul, was a member of the Order of the Dragon, a chivalric order dedicated to defending Christendom against the Ottoman Turks. The young Vlad and his brother Radu were sent as hostages to the Ottoman court to ensure their father's loyalty. This period of captivity profoundly influenced Vlad, instilling in him a deep-seated hatred for the Ottomans and a ruthless disposition. Upon his release, Vlad returned to Wallachia to reclaim his father's throne. His ascent to power was marked by a series of brutal campaigns to consolidate his rule. Vlad's methods were as effective as they were terrifying. He used impalement not only as a method of execution, but also as a psychological weapon to deter enemies and consolidate power. In one of the most notorious episodes of his reign, Vlad invited hundreds of boyars, the powerful nobility of Wallachia, to a banquet. After a feast, he had them all arrested, impaled, or enslaved, eliminating any threat to his authority. His reign of terror extended to the Ottoman Empire. When the Sultan sent an army to subdue him, they were met with a horrifying sight, a forest of impaled corpses outside Vlad's capital, Targovisht. This grisly display earned him the nickname Vlad the Impaler. Vlad's military campaigns were brutal but strategically astute. He employed guerrilla tactics, night raids, and scorched earth policies to resist the vastly superior Ottoman forces. Despite his ruthless methods, Many Romanians remember Vlad as a national hero who defended their land against foreign invaders. His strict and often draconian justice system also brought relative peace and order to Wallachia. Vlad's reign came to an end in 1462 when he was betrayed and captured by the Hungarian king, Matthias Corvinus. He spent over a decade in captivity before briefly regaining power in Wallachia. Vlad's final years were spent in constant conflict until his death in battle in 1476. His body was reportedly decapitated and his head sent to the Sultan as proof of his demise. Vlad the Impaler's legacy endured not just in the annals of history, but also in the realm of legend. His bloodthirsty reputation inspired Bram Stoker's 1897 novel Dracula, forever linking the historical figure with the fictional vampire. Today, Vlad is a complex symbol, seen by some as a cruel tyrant and by others as a fierce defender of his homeland. Vlad's cruelty was not confined to his enemies alone. Tales abound of his merciless treatment of his own people. One such story tells of a golden cup placed at the central square of Targoviste for travelers to drink from. Despite its immense value, the cup remained untouched, a testament to the fear Vlad instilled in his subjects and the strict laws he enforced. His sense of justice was brutal and unforgiving. It is said that a merchant once complained to Vlad that he had been robbed. Vlad promised to recover the stolen goods and ensure the thief was caught. The next day, the merchant found his goods returned with an extra bag of gold. When he reported the discrepancy to Vlad, the prince responded, 
that had the merchant not reported the extra gold, he would have been impaled for dishonesty. Such stories illustrate the iron grip Vlad maintained over Wallachia. Vlad's relationships with other rulers were equally complex. He sought alliances with neighboring Christian kingdoms to strengthen his position against the Ottomans, yet his brutal methods often alienated potential allies. His fierce resistance against the Ottoman Empire earned him both respect and fear. Even Sultan Mehmed II, the conqueror of Constantinople, found himself wary of Vlad's unpredictable and ferocious tactics. Vlad the Impaler's story is one of contradictions. He was a ruler who brought order through fear, a defender of his homeland who employed terror as his weapon of choice. His legacy is a dark tapestry of heroism and horror, interwoven with the blood of his victims and the myths of Dracula. As we delve into the lives of history's most diabolical figures, Vlad the Impaler stands as a haunting reminder of the thin line between savior and tyrant. Our next diabolical figure is known as the Blood Countess, Elizabeth Bathory. Born into Hungarian nobility in 1560, Elizabeth is often cited as the most prolific female serial killer in history. Her crimes were as ghastly as they were numerous. Bathory was accused of torturing and killing hundreds of young girls, allegedly bathing in their blood in a vain attempt to preserve her youth. The tales of her sadism and cruelty spread throughout Europe, cementing her place as a symbol of pure evil. After her arrest, she was imprisoned in her own castle, where she died four years later, unrepentant and surrounded by the echoes of her victim's screams. No exploration of history's most diabolical figures would be complete without Adolf Hitler, the architect of one of humanity's darkest chapters. Adolf Hitler was born in Austria in 1889, and his early life was marked by instability and disappointment. He moved to Germany in 1913 and served as a soldier during World War I, an experience that profoundly shaped his ideology. Following Germany's defeat, Hitler joined the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, where his oratory skills and fervent nationalism quickly propelled him to prominence. Hitler's vision for Germany was rooted in a twisted ideology of racial purity and Aryan supremacy. He capitalized on the economic despair and societal unrest following World War I, promising to restore Germany to greatness. In 1933, he was appointed Chancellor of Germany, and soon after, he established a totalitarian regime. The Nazi state was characterized by aggressive propaganda, the suppression of dissent, and the persecution of those deemed undesirable. One of Hitler's most heinous acts was the implementation of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935 which stripped Jews of their citizenship and legal rights. This was the beginning of a systematic campaign of discrimination, persecution, and violence that culminated in the Holocaust. Over six million Jews, along with millions of others, including Romani people, disabled individuals, political dissidents, and more, were murdered in what remains one of the darkest periods in human history. The Holocaust was carried out with chilling efficiency, Jews and other targeted groups were rounded up, transported to concentration camps, and subjected to inhumane conditions, forced labor, medical experiments, and mass executions. The world watched in horror as the full extent of Nazi atrocities was revealed after the war. World War II, ignited by Hitler's expansionist ambitions, resulted in unprecedented destruction and loss of life. As Allied forces closed in on Berlin in 1945, Hitler chose to end his life, leaving behind a legacy of unparalleled evil. The Nuremberg trials held in the aftermath sought to bring some measure of justice to the victims of the Holocaust, though the scars of this dark chapter remain. Next is the evil leader Pol Pot. Our journey through history's most diabolical figures now brings us to Cambodia, where a leader's vision for a radical utopia turned into one of the most horrifying genocides of the 20th century. Pol Pot, the leader of the Khmer Rouge. Pol Pot, born Salath Tsar in 1925, was a radical communist who sought to transform Cambodia into a classless agrarian society. He rose to power in 1975, following years of civil war, and immediately began implementing his brutal vision. The Khmer Rouge evacuated entire cities, forcing people into labor camps where they were subjected to starvation, disease, and execution. 
Intellectuals, professionals, and anyone perceived as a threat to the regime were targeted. Over the course of four years, an estimated two million people, nearly a quarter of Cambodia's population, perished. The killing fields, mass grave sites scattered across the country, stand as a grim testament to the horrors inflicted under Pol Pot's rule. The regime was finally overthrown in 1979, but the scars of this genocide continue to haunt Cambodia. Pol Pot's journey to power began in a small village in Cambodia, where he was born into a relatively prosperous family. He received a scholarship to study in France, where he was exposed to Marxist and communist ideologies. Upon his return to Cambodia, he joined the underground communist movement, eventually becoming the leader of the Khmer Rouge. In April 1975, the Khmer Rouge captured Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, and Pol Pot declared the start of year zero, a radical reformation that aimed to erase the past and create a new society based on agrarian communism. Cities were emptied and millions were forced into the countryside to work in collective farms under brutal conditions. The intellectual and cultural elites were systematically exterminated in an attempt to purge the country of any opposition to the regime's radical policies. The Khmer Rouge's rule was characterized by extreme brutality and paranoia, the regime viewed anyone with ties to the previous government, educated individuals, and even those who wore glasses as enemies of the state. Entire families were executed, and the regime's own members were not immune to purges. Pol Pot's relentless pursuit of a classless society led to widespread famine, disease, and mass executions. The infamous Tool Sleng Prison, also known as S21, became a symbol of the regime's cruelty, where thousands were tortured and killed. Despite the Khmer Rouge's attempts to control every aspect of life in Cambodia, resistance grew. In 1979, Vietnamese forces invaded Cambodia, toppling Pol Pot's regime. Pol Pot fled into the jungles of Western Cambodia, where he continued to lead guerrilla forces against the Vietnamese-backed government. Although he was captured and placed under house arrest by his own former comrades in 1997, Pol Pot never faced trial for his crimes. He died in 1998, leaving behind a legacy of unimaginable horror and suffering. The aftermath of Pol Pot's rule left Cambodia in ruins. The social, economic, and psychological scars inflicted by the Khmer Rouge continue to affect the country to this day. Memorials like the Chong Ek Killing Fields and the Tuol Sleng Genocide Museum stand as somber reminders of the atrocities committed. The Cambodian people, however, have shown remarkable resilience and strength in their efforts to rebuild their nation and preserve the memory of those lost to the horrors of Pol Pot's regime. Now let's turn to Idi Amin. Our journey through history's most diabolical figures now brings us to Uganda, where a military dictator's reign of terror left a lasting legacy of fear and suffering. Idi Amin, the self-proclaimed butcher of Uganda. Idi Amin seized power in 1971 through a military coup. He sent his rule was marked by widespread human rights abuses, political repression, and ethnic persecution. Amin's erratic and brutal behavior led to the deaths of an estimated 300,000 Ugandans. Idi Amin Dada was born around 1925 in Koboko, a town in northwestern Uganda. He received little formal education and joined the King's African Rifles, a regiment of the British colonial army, where he quickly rose through the ranks due to his physical prowess and leadership skills. By the time Uganda gained independence from Britain in 1962, Amin had become one of the country's top military officers. In January 1971, taking advantage of political turmoil and his position as commander of the army, Amin staged a coup while President Milton Obote was attending a conference in Singapore. Promising to restore stability and eliminate corruption, Amin was initially welcomed by many Ugandans. However, his true nature soon became evident. Amin's regime quickly descended into a nightmare of brutality. He established a secret police force, the State Research Bureau, which became notorious for its arbitrary arrests, torture, and executions. Amin's paranoia led him to purge the military and government of anyone he perceived as a threat, often based on tribal affiliations. Public executions became a common sight, intended to instill fear and demonstrate his absolute power. 
One of Amin's most infamous acts was the expulsion of Uganda's Asian community in 1972. Claiming that God had told him to do so in a dream, Amin gave Asians, primarily those of Indian descent, 90 days to leave the country. This drastic move led to the expulsion of approximately 80,000 people, many of whom were successful business owners and professionals. The result was an economic collapse from which Uganda took decades to recover. Amin's rule was characterized by a bizarre mix of cruelty and eccentricity. He declared himself president for life and awarded himself numerous grandiose titles, including conqueror of the British Empire. Meanwhile, his brutal repression continued unabated. Amnesty International and other human rights organizations reported widespread human rights abuses, including the massacre of entire villages, the use of torture, and extrajudicial killings. Estimates suggest that Amin's regime was responsible for the deaths of up to 300,000 people. Internationally, Amin's actions further isolated Uganda. He aligned himself with controversial figures such as Libya's Muammar Gaddafi and Palestine Liberation Organization leader Yasser Arafat, while antagonizing former colonial power Britain. His erratic behavior and grandiose claims made him a subject of international ridicule, but his brutality was no laughing matter. In 1978, Amin attempted to annex the Kagera region of Tanzania, prompting a full-scale invasion by Tanzanian forces and Ugandan exiles. In April 1979, Tanzanian forces and Ugandan rebels captured the capital Kampala, effectively ending Amin's rule. Amin fled into exile, first to Libya and then to Saudi Arabia, where he lived out the remainder of his life in relative obscurity. Despite attempts to rehabilitate his image, he remained unrepentant for his crimes, and his death in 2003 brought little closure to the many victims of his regime. The legacy of Idi Amin's reign of terror continues to haunt Uganda. The economic and social damage inflicted during his eight-year rule left deep scars on the nation. Memorials and efforts to document the atrocities serve as a somber reminder of the past. Yet Uganda has also shown remarkable resilience gradually rebuilding and striving to move forward from the horrors of Amin's dictatorship. Next is Ivan the Terrible. From the annals of Rome, we move to 16th century Russia, where a ruler's name still evokes fear and dread. Ivan IV, known as Ivan the Terrible, was born in 1530 into the powerful Rurik dynasty. His early life was fraught with danger and violence. Orphaned at the age of eight, Ivan witnessed the brutal struggle for power among the Russian nobility. This tumultuous upbringing shaped his character, instilling a deep mistrust and a propensity for ruthless action. In 1547, Ivan was crowned the first Tsar of all Russia, a title that symbolized his absolute authority. His early reign was marked by significant reforms aimed at centralizing power and curbing the influence of the boyars, the powerful Russian nobility. Ivan established the Zemsky Sobor, Russia's first national assembly of the estates, and reformed the military, creating a more efficient and centralized state. However, Ivan's reign took a dark turn following the death of his beloved wife, Anastasia, in 1560. Consumed by grief and convinced she had been poisoned by the boyars, Ivan's behavior grew increasingly erratic and paranoid. In 1565, he instituted the Oprishnina, a policy that divided the country into two parts. The Oprishnina, directly ruled by Ivan the Terrible and his loyalists, and the Zemshchina, administered by the boyars. The Oprishniki, Ivan's personal guard, were granted sweeping powers to suppress and terrorize anyone deemed a threat. They rode black horses and wore black robes, symbolizing their role as the Tsar's enforcers. Under Ivan's orders, they carried out mass executions, expropriated lands, and spread fear throughout the land. The sack of Novgorod in 1570 was one of the most infamous acts of the Oprishniki, where thousands were tortured and killed on accusations of treason. It's Ivan the Terrible. His reign was also marked by relentless military campaigns. The Livonian War, which lasted from 1558 to 1583, was an attempt to expand Russian territory into the Baltic region. Despite early successes, the prolonged conflict drained Russia's resources and led to widespread suffering. The war ended in failure, exacerbating Ivan's paranoia and leading to further repression at home. Tragedy struck Ivan's personal life as well. 
In a fit of rage in 1581, Ivan struck his son and heir, Ivan Ivanovich, with his staff, fatally wounding him. The death of his son was a devastating blow, leaving Russia without a competent heir and plunging Ivan into deeper despair. His remaining son, Feodor, was mentally unfit to rule, which led to a period of instability known as the Time of Troubles after Ivan's death. Ivan the Terrible died in 1584, leaving behind a complex and controversial legacy. He is remembered both as a ruler who sought to centralize and strengthen the Russian state, and as a tyrant whose reign of terror inflicted immense suffering on his people. His brutal methods and paranoid delusions left a lasting scar on Russia, shaping its history for centuries to come. Modern depictions of Ivan the Terrible, from literature to film, continue to grapple with the duality of his character, reflecting the enduring fascination with this dark and troubled figure. Now on to Nero. From the medieval courts of Russia, we now turn to ancient Rome, where a ruler's name has become synonymous with tyranny and debauchery. Nero, the fifth Roman emperor, whose reign marked one of the most notorious periods in Roman history. Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, known simply as Nero, became emperor of Rome in AD 54, succeeding his adoptive father, Emperor Claudius. Nero's early rule was marked by political stability and cultural achievements, guided by the influence of his mother, Agrippina the Younger, his tutor Seneca, and the Praetorian prefect Burrus. However, as Nero grew older, his darker impulses began to surface, leading to a reign characterized by cruelty, extravagance, and madness. Nero was born in AD 37, the son of Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus and Agrippina the Younger, a powerful and ambitious woman. His path to the throne was paved by Agrippina's machinations, including her marriage to her uncle, Emperor Claudius, whom she later poisoned to ensure Nero's succession. Once emperor, Nero initially ruled with the guidance of his mother and advisors, enacting reforms and patronizing the arts. However, his relationship with Agrippina soon deteriorated. Nero's relationship with his mother became increasingly strained as he sought to assert his independence. In AD 59, he ordered her assassination, a brutal act that marked the beginning of his descent into tyranny. Agrippina's death removed a significant check on Nero's power, and he began to indulge his every whim and desire. Nero's extravagance knew no bounds. He spent lavishly on entertainment, building projects, and his personal pleasures, draining the imperial treasury. Images of the Great Fire of Rome, the Destruction, and Nero's Response. One of the most infamous events of Nero's reign was the Great Fire of Rome in AD 64, which ravaged the city for six days. Much of Rome was destroyed, and thousands were left homeless. According to some historical accounts, Nero watched the city burn while playing his lyre and singing about the fall of Troy. Whether or not this is true, the fire provided Nero with an opportunity to rebuild Rome according to his grand vision. He constructed a lavish palace complex known as the Domus Aurea, or Golden House, on the ruins. To deflect blame for the fire, Nero targeted a convenient scapegoat, the burgeoning Christian community. He accused them of starting the fire and launched a brutal persecution. Christians were arrested, tortured, and executed in the most gruesome ways. Many were crucified, burned alive, or thrown to wild animals in the arena. This marked one of the first major persecutions of Christians in the Roman Empire and solidified Nero's reputation for cruelty. Nero fancied himself a great artist and performer. He took to the stage, participating in music, poetry, and acting contests, much to the dismay of the Roman elite who saw such activities as beneath the dignity of an emperor. His public performances and insistence on winning accolades, whether deserved or not, further alienated the Senate and the nobility. Nero's increasingly erratic behavior and autocratic rule led to growing discontent among the ruling class. By AD 68, discontent had reached a boiling point. Rebellions broke out in various provinces, with the Gallic and Spanish legions openly revolting against Nero's rule. The Roman Senate, seeing the writing on the wall, declared Nero a public enemy and backed the claims of Galba, the governor of Hispania Tarraconensis, as the new emperor. Facing certain execution, Nero fled Rome. In his final moments, abandoned by nearly all his supporters, Nero took his own life, reportedly uttering the words, qualis artifex perio, which means, what an artist dies in me. 
Nero's death plunged Rome into further chaos, leading to the tumultuous year of the four emperors as different factions vied for power. Despite his ignominious end, Nero's legacy endured in Roman culture and history. He became a symbol of decadence, tyranny, and the corrupting influence of absolute power. His grandiose construction projects, artistic pursuits, and brutal persecution of Christians left an indelible mark on Rome's history. These figures, Though separated by time and geography, share a common thread of malevolence that transcends the ages. Their stories serve as grim reminders of the capacity for evil within the human soul. As we reflect on these dark tales, let us also remember the resilience and courage of those who stood against such darkness. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the shadows. If you found this video intriguing, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others who appreciate delving into the darker side of history. Subscribe to Facts Intrigue for more captivating stories and hit the bell icon to be notified of our next exploration. Until then, stay curious, stay vigilant, and remember, history often holds more questions than answers.